to the chase, evidence based. Pull up a chair, let's get this straight. Peptide buddy, he's your peptide buddy. Hey everybody, I've gotten quite a few questions lately on these different routes of administration when we're talking about BPC-157 and TB-500. Among the many peptides we've discussed on this channel, only a few notably possess strong oral bioavailability. There's ibutamarin or MK677, which is technically a non-peptide that acts similarly to ipamorelin, and there's BPC-157. And when we use these terms, it pretty much means strong bang for your buck, in the sense that most of what you're consuming trans translates into available product that can conduct its actions within the body. Now a good place to start is a topic that we already made a full video on, and I'll make sure to link it as well as the other relevant videos in the description below, but we can review some details here. And this was the video that compares BPC-157's injectable versus oral administration. And like with many things, we often ask ourselves when we get into such deep weeds, how much of a change are we actually making by tweaking these little tiny factors? But some of the key points addressed in the video are that if BPC-157 is used, the arginate salt form is far superior in oral bioavailability. And on top of that, we talked about if you should use oral BPC-157 before, after, or during a meal, which is more of a non-issue when it comes to the arginate salt form given the fact that it does really well in a highly acidic environment. Particularly, it was tested in an environment more acidic than the stomach's resting pH, more similar to that of gastric acid itself. So I do think that for those interested in taking this by pill, they can probably craft a decent regimen, assuming they have legitimate, compounded, appropriately BPC-157 in this arginate salt form, which you'll see as BPC-157 arginate. And we also did a video not solely on intranasal peptides, but it was in our first Q&A, which I'll also link in the description below. The overarching theme of that video is that intranasal administration may be preferable for somebody who exhibits a phobia towards needles, which I get it, it exists, there are many things out there I'm afraid of, some of which I'm too embarrassed to announce on the channel, but given the lower bioavailability of these products when used through the good old nostrils, you'd have to use a vast amount more, a much greater volume of total product, which not only means that you'll be sniffing up quite a bit, but this also influences cost as well. In a nutshell, it's plausible to achieve a similar circulating concentration of these intranasal products, but due to the volume needed to possess the same circulating effective product, you're likely sacrificing comfort and a good amount of money to do so. Now let's hone in on BPC-157 and TB-500 via alternate routes. I think oral administration of BPC-157 is something we've covered enough of, and don't forget that previous videos discussing these topics will certainly be linked below. And this is a good point to discuss this. If you haven't already and you're still watching, please hit that like and subscribe button. It helps me out more than you may think. If you hated the video, drop a dislike, raise your pitchforks. I appreciate you all. As you'll see, there exist Wolverine Stack nasal sprays. They're not very popular popular, have questioned legitimacy, and are very expensive. And if you look at the dosages administered per spray, you'll see immediately what I mean about volume. Let's start off by saying there's no research explicitly on intranasal bioavailability of BPC-157, which further complicates things, obviously, because how can you adhere to a dosing regimen when we don't know how much a spray will yield? Right, let's take an example. You'll see that BPC-157 is oftentimes sold as 10 milligrams per spray. Let's say that people use BPC-157 157 typically at a dose ranging from 200 to 500 micrograms per day. There's some whole numbers, which makes things a bit easier. But that is 20 to 50 times less than what's being nasally administered in one spray. So obviously, producers feel that people are getting a lot less nasally or need a hugely greater volume to achieve that effect. However, we have general knowledge about BPC's bioavailability otherwise, injectably or orally. So it can be stated that using the nasal spray will likely give some some circulating amount of BPC-157. But what can also be said is that we have no idea remotely how much, nor can we create a dosing regimen given the completely literal absence of the data. And just so we're clear, the exact same idea translates to TB-500. Not to mention, we don't know what in the world actually is in these minimally produced nasal sprays. Now on top of that, although you'll see TB500 purportedly sold as a pill, there's no information surrounding its oral bioavailability, nor does that data exist for the peptide of which it's a fragment, TB4. TB4, which does in and of itself possess a good amount of data otherwise, does not have any surrounding bioavailability in general, so the slightest of data we can attempt to translate 
light isn't even there. The overarching idea isn't that if you take enough by mouth or by nose, it won't serve a purpose. It's that in a world of unknowns, when it comes to long-term effects of these compounds and doing what we can to dose appropriately and manage safety concerns, all of that goes out the window with lack of access to the most minimal of data. And I've shared my thoughts on the peptide blend recently, and I'm not the biggest fan due to particular safety concerns and some other reasons. I'll link this video in the description below as well, why not? But these concerns are compounded significantly when we can't even assess what we're getting. Not to mention that given such few companies produce these, we don't know A, if they're legitimate and safe, B, if they're dosed appropriately, and C, what the heck we're even getting out of it. I do suspect, and I'm sure that some people would disagree with me here, they're probably trying to sell something, but what do I know? I hope I could clarify a few things I've been getting asked a lot lately. As always, you are all the best, and your support, comments, input have all been immensely helpful and quite funny to me. That said, I'm not going to draw conclusions on something where the basis, or the very most basic of information to draw such conclusions does not even exist. So for those of you who yourself or have a friend who experienced these peptides in other forms or formats, please leave a comment, share your experience. I find that most of you either have something intriguing or hilarious to share. And thanks again for watching. I hope you have a great day. Cut to the chase, evidence-based. Pull up a chair, let's get this straight. Peptide buddy, he's your peptide buddy.